Well, for our time together uh, this morning, I want to look at probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible uh, that is set in one of the least known passages in the Bible. And so we're going to read it together now. I'm in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And I'll start reading in verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16 says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And that is, this is the judgment. That light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. May God bless the reading of his word. Many people, though I fear it's becoming less and less, have an idea of John 3.16. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And, and it's understandable how this verse has become so universally accepted. You're talking God's love towards us, uh, the ultimate sacrifice, everlasting life. I mean, who doesn't want that? And it's easy to take comfort in this verse even if you don't believe in the rest of the Bible. I mean, it fits in with this generic, worldly, God is love, I won't be punished no matter what I do, and they have no problem believing in a God like that. Of course, that's not what this verse teaches, and the immediate context makes that clear, and it's that context that I want to look at this morning. I've, um, I, I've picked this passage for today because it perfectly answers the question of why did Jesus come? All right, we've been celebrating the birth of Jesus. He came into the world as I just prayed. He left the heavenly realm, came to earth as a human. Why? Why be born as a baby? Why come as a human? This passage gives us the answer. And so let's get into it. I have three points for us this morning. Very, very simple. God gave us a gift. Some people refuse the gift. Some people receive the gift. Simple, but not easy. So let's get into it. First, God gave us a gift. The world has fallen. We know this. It has rejected God and wants to go its own way. We have made God our enemy. And because of this, we live with the reality of death. Not only do we live with the reality of death, but we are under the promise of eternal wrath. And yet God still loves us. For reasons that we can't understand... God still wants to save us. And so in order to accomplish that, he gave us his son, who is the only one who could save us. So he gave us the gift of his son. But Jesus is the gift. Jesus is not the deliverer of the gift. He is the gift. He's not the Amazon driver who drops it off at the doorstep and then leaves. No, he is the package that was left on our doorstep. And it's only in Jesus that you get eternal life, right? Romans 6.23. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And that's an important distinction because I think many people believe that all they have to do is just believe in God. Generic God. And that if they believe that God is real, then nothing else matters. But that's not true. And we'll see that in the rest of this passage. You, you do have to believe in God, but you have to believe something specific. Verse 18 here says that you have to believe in the name of the only Son of God. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. There's this video that's been going around recently. 
Um, I don't know if you've seen it. It's by this guy named Brad Lee, first name, last name. Uh, Brad Lee on a podcast. And he says basically, hey, listen up. I'm about to save your life. And he starts talking about the name of Jesus and how everybody's gotten the name of Jesus wrong. And his whole point is not necessarily, oh, you need to be saying it in Hebrew or anything like that. His whole point is, if you go up to heaven and say, I'm here to meet Jesus, they're going to look at you like you're crazy and say, Jesus, we, we don't know who that is. My people know my name and you don't know my name, so you're out. And I bring this up because there's a good chance you may come across something like that. I don't know if you've seen the video, but there's lots of people who are making arguments nowadays that if you don't have the right name of Jesus, then you're blaspheming him. And I don't want you to start questioning everything because of an idiot on a podcast, right? And I say that um, because his arguments aren't solid in any way, shape, or form. I mean, not only does he missay Bible verses and misuse Bible verses, he also makes up his own. Says, oh, well, the Bible says this, and the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. Aside from the fact that he gets very basic facts about history wrong, and aside from the fact that he cusses like every other word throughout the whole thing. There are two main issues with what he brings up and with what people who bring this sort of argument do wrong. First, they make a linguistic thing. Remember that the New Testament was primarily written in Greek. And in the Greek language, especially the biblical Greek, there was no letter J, right? And so when, like we read last night, the angel comes and says, you will name him Jesus, it would be actually pronounced with an I first, right? You, like Jesus, something like that. And um, when the name gets translated into English, we transliterate it, we pronounce it Jesus. And this is a normal thing we do all the time. And so, for instance, my oldest daughter, her name is Susanna. It comes from the Hebrew Shoshana, right, which means Lily. How weird would it be if you went up to her today and said, hi, Susanna, and she said, no, 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 no. It's, it's actually pronounced Shoshana. Like, but that, that's not the way that it's spelled. That's not what it looks like, right? What are we, we're translating it. And everybody does this every single day. Same thing, by the way, with the name Jerusalem, right? In the Bible, in the Greek, it's spelled with an I. But when we translate it into English, it's with a J. So there's a linguistic issue that this guy is just not getting. And other people who don't say, oh, you can't use the name Jesus. It's, it's a translation thing. They just don't get. But the bigger issue is he treats the name of the Son of God like a password. Like you get to heaven and he actually uses language like there's an, a big mean looking angel there. Like why should I let you in here, right? And unless you have the right passphrase, you can't get in. But if you do have the right name, then it doesn't really matter how you live. You can do whatever you want on earth, but whenever you get to heaven, if you just say, I'm here for, oh you can't say Jesus. If you're here for the weird name that he comes up with, then automatically God has to let you get in. But that's not what John means. The Apostle John, when he says, you have to believe in the name of the Son of God, that's not what he's talking about. You can't just throw Jesus' name around like a, uh, like a password to a bouncer in order to get in. We'll talk exactly about what that means in a minute, but first look at this, it's fascinating. Verse 17. Verse 17 says that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn it. Right? People love clinging to that verse. Hey, Jesus didn't come to condemn, right? But right after that, verse 18 says, if you don't believe in the name of Jesus, then you're already condemned. Jesus doesn't have to come and condemn you. Why not? Because you're already under the wrath of God. Condemnation is based on belief. If you believe in Jesus, and again, not simply that he exists, but, but that salvation is in him. If you believe in Jesus, then you are not condemned. And so let's think further about what does it really mean to believe in the name of the Son of God. I'll look at it first negatively and then positively. The negative side is our second point, right? So the first point, God gave a gift. Second point, some people refuse the gift. A negative example of belief. Look again at verse 19, John 3, 19. Bless you. John 3, 19. And this is the judgment. That light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. And so, Jesus is the light that came into the world, but these people hated the light. Why? Because they loved darkness. Now, notice it did not say that they didn't believe Jesus never existed. I mean, sure, there are people today who think that Jesus never existed, but that's not the people John is talking about. There were people who heard him teach, who saw him with their physical eyes, but they didn't believe in his name. They didn't trust him as their savior. They, they didn't give themselves to him. Why not? Because their works were evil. Because they did wicked things. So picture this. You go home after church. Your family gets together for the meal. Grandpa comes over and he gives you a present. Like, here, I got this for you. And you're like, uh, sorry, Grandpa, I can't right now. I'm tick-tocking or something. Um, right? You, you don't receive the gift because you're busy doing something else already. Now, that's not an exact picture, but it's close. People don't want the light of Jesus because they're already doing what they want to do. People don't want to receive Jesus because they know the things that they're already doing are wrong. Even if they don't know why it's wrong. They still know that it's wrong. I mean, God has put eternity in our hearts, yet so much so that we can't really get it. We can't really grasp it. God has put his glory on display in all of creation in the things that were made. And so we can look at mountains, and we can look at the ocean, and we can look at trees, and we can look at uh, far galaxies, and we can see enough to know that there is a God, and he is really, really powerful, and yet we can't actually know this God without help. God has even put his law on our hearts so that we know there is a right and a wrong. And according to verse 20, the light of Jesus makes all of this abundantly clear to them. It makes it clear by exposing their works as wicked. And they hate that. They don't want anyone to look at them and say, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is evil. What you're doing leads to death. So, so God sent his son to save the world, but the world doesn't think it needs to be saved. It doesn't want to be told that, that it does need to be saved. And so they hate the light. And, and check what it says again, verse 20. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light. So part of what it means to believe in the name of the Son of God involves coming to him. And that's what we see next, the positive side, right? It's our last point. So God gave a gift. Some people refused the gift. Some people received the gift. Look again at verse 21. I hear that amen. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. It's fascinating here that the opposite of doing wicked things, the people in the dark, the opposite of doing wicked things is doing what is true. Now, literally in the Greek, this is doing the truth. But what does that mean? All right, first of all, what is it? And second of all, can you even do the truth before coming to Jesus? All right, whoever does the truth comes to the light. Whoever does the truth is the one who receives Jesus. Doesn't the Apostle John know about the depravity of man? Doesn't he know that you can't do anything good until after you receive Jesus? Look again at verse 21. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And so catch this. In this context, doing the truth means living in light of the truth that Jesus is the light. That he really is the son of God and that he came to save. And when you realize that, you happily come to him. And here's the cool part. The so that, at the end of verse 21, they come to Jesus so that it can be clear that their works have been carried out in God. The person who does the truth comes to Jesus. And they don't come bragging like, hey, look what I've done. 
I've earned the right, I've earned the right for salvation. Look at the good things that I've done. I deserve this. No, no, no. When you truly understand who God is and who you are, you come humbly knowing that the only hope you have is not that you've done the right thing to get in, but that he has done it in, on your behalf. That's the belief that God is looking for. That's why Jesus came. Jesus did not come for the righteous. He came for the sinners. Jesus did not come to heal the healthy. He came to heal the sick. Jesus came to lay down his life for the sake of his enemies, not those who were on his team. That if his enemies would own their sin sickness... That if they would admit that they are not righteous, if they would turn themselves over like an enemy coming to the enemy camp and saying, hey, I'm here to turn myself over as a prisoner of war. Do that and beg for mercy. Then God would forgive them of their sins in Jesus' name. And God would heal them of their depravity by Jesus' life. He would give them his righteousness through the obedience of his son. And he would adopt them as children to be brothers and sisters with Christ as co-heirs. And that's why Jesus came. That's why we celebrate him here today, right? That's the call of all of us to live in the light, to live in the reality that Jesus came in glory, but in a humble glory. I mean, to be placed in a manger in the middle of nowhere. He laid his glorious glory aside, and he did that so that he could live his life perfectly on our behalf. And the call for us then is to come to him for forgiveness and love and eternal life. But it's only in the name of Jesus, which is why we make such a big deal about his name. So as we continue to go through today and celebrate Christmas, I know sometimes like Christmas at like around 11 o'clock, it feels like Christmas is already over. But let's continue just meditating and thinking on the fact that the light burst into the darkness so that whoever lives in the reality of that light will come to Jesus and can receive salvation. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you again that not only did your son Jesus come as a baby, but that baby grew up and he lived perfectly. And he taught us the truth. And he showed us the way. He, he showed us the way to himself so that he could be the gate and the door that we needed to get to you. And then he died. He died in obedience to your command. Taking on the punishment and the wrath that we deserved. And then he rose again. And we know and we firmly believe that he is coming back. And so I pray that you would put in us such a longing for his return that our every single existent day, day in existence would be radically changed. And we ask this for the glory of his name. Amen.